All right. It is 12.30, so let's get started, and people can join in afterwards. There was a big storm, so uh, some people may have lost power. Who knows? Anyway, we are working on development, and this is the development chapter showing up here in your screen. We are working on development, but I want to jump to development for just a second and show you that there are actually two lecture series. There's the lecture series on development that we are going through right now, but there's also a lecture series on language and development, and you need to make sure that you watch that language, um, look through that language one by yourselves. There's only a few slides to it, and I will mention a lot of it here when we're talking about development, but I need you to make sure that you go through those language ones also because language is a part of development and although your book includes it in intelligence, I include it in the development section because it is a developmental process and does not need to be in the intelligence chapter. So uh, I, I ask the questions and I, in, on the quizzes and on the test for development, it will also include the language section. So I just wanted to make sure you all understood that. So that's where we are, and I will now switch over to our lecture, which I left you again at a cliffhanger, talking about the teratogens that affect development, and I said that there is a teratogen that is passed to humans by cats, and yes, there is. It's called taxoplasmosis, and it is a an organism, it is not a virus or a bacteria, it is a small microorganism that is so small that it can float on the dust that is spread by kitty litter. So if you are cleaning out a kitty litter box, the dust that comes out of that box can include taxoplasmosis and you will breathe it in and get taxoplasmosis from that. Now, it doesn't last very long in the human being, but if a person is pregnant, it can cause problems for the developing child because of that um, taxoplasmosis organism. The other one, syphilis, is a uh, sexually transmitted disease, but the taxoplasmosis is kind of interesting because it doesn't live its entire life in a cat. It starts off its life in a mouse, and it can only grow so big in the mouse before it has to get into a cat in order to finish its final development stage. And we're talking about development here, although we're talking about human development, here is a, another organism's developmental processes. So it gets into the cat because the mouse's brain is actually affected by taxoplasmosis so that it no longer fears and is likely to approach cats. And if a mouse approaches a cat, it's going to get eaten. And that's how the taxoplasmosis gets into the cat to finally finish its developmental stage. Now, it gets into the mouse because a mouse comes into contact with the cat poop outside in the environment. But what's interesting about that is that I know plenty of people, and you probably do too, who at first did not like cats, and then they met someone and started dating someone or married someone who had a cat, and so they're sticking around the cats a lot, and all of a sudden they end up liking cats. And I'm wondering, okay, did they get infected by taxoplasmosis, which affected their brain, and now they like cats the same way that mice are not afraid and, and, and approach cats? So I don't know if that's true or not, but I sure know a lot of people that are like that. So that's teratogens. Now, the, the mutagens are very different than teratogens because mutagens change your genetics. And if your genetics are changed, then there's a possibility that it will go into your egg and, or into your sperm and pass to the next generation. Whereas teratogens only affect what the developmental stage that's happening in this 
current generation at this particular time, that one person, their genetics are fine and they can have a perfectly normal child even though they might be a flipper child, for instance. Mutagens can pass their changes on to the next generation and the next. There are numerous types of mutagens. We usually talk about the single gene type mutagen, which requires a recessive gene and another recessive gene to be effective, or if the mutagen is a dominant gene, then one dominant gene and the normal gene, the dominant gene will take precedence. But if you have recessive, you need two of them, one from the mother, one from the father. And I have two that I like to talk about, and that is sickle cell anemia, because it is considered a recessive, but it is not a recessive gene, and it is not a dominant gene either. It is the only gene I know that is a partially dominant characteristic gene. If you have the sickle cell gene on one of your chromosomes, then you do have what's called sickle cell trait. You may never recognize that there's anything wrong, and you may not know that you have that gene, but if then you come and, and marry someone who also has the sickle cell trait, then you have a chance of having a child with both of them, which makes them sickle cell. What sickle cell does is normal blood cells are round. And so as they bump against each other inside the, the, your veins and arteries, they just roll over each other. In sickle cell, they're sickle shaped. And so the sickle cells can lock onto each other and cause blood clots. They also don't hold oxygen as well either and you can die from sickle cell. And even if you don't die from sickle cell, it's extremely painful and debilitating disease. Uh, I know someone with sickle cell, and it's not, a pretty, it's not a pretty disease. Their parents did not know that they were sickle cell trait. Now, the reason I bring up sickle cell is because it's very unusual being a partially dominant trait and why it exists in the universe is very interesting as well. It started as a mutation in Africa. In the area that it started, there was malaria, and you could very easily die from malaria if you had normal blood cells. If you had sickle cell, you also would die because of the sickle cell. But sickle cell trait, having one normal gene and one sickle cell gene, you didn't die from cell, and you were immune from malaria. So they survived much better than the normal genes and much better than the sickle cell, and that's why the trait just continued to increase and increase and increase, and why we have so much of it in the environment today because it was useful. Even though it's deadly in its combination, recessive-recessive, it's useful in its single and normal gene configuration. The blue fugates is a whole nother story. Uh, some of you probably know of the Smurfs, and I am going to bring up a new share for you. Hold on one second. While I bring up the share, you should now see on your screen a picture of the blue fugates. It's probably not a very good picture if you're on a cell phone, but if you're on a full-blown monitor, you should be able to tell that some of the people in this picture are Smurfettes. They are blue-skinned, and the the, the uh, blue fugates of Kentucky are blue-skinned people. Now, they have a child here, a child here, a child here, and a child here who are pink-skinned, but then they have blue skin, blue skin, blue skin, blue skin, and blue skin. And the reason for this is a recessive trait. We, our blood 
when it is oxygenated by the lungs or when we cut ourselves and the oxygen hits our blood and oxygenates the blood is red. When it is non-oxygenated, it is a darker color, much darker color. And through the skin, if you look at your veins through the skin, the veins look bluish. And the only reason I look pink is because the arteries on the surface of my skin are carrying oxygenated pink or reddish blood. If instead it was carrying non-oxygenated blood or blood that doesn't turn red when it is oxygenated, I would look blue, as blue as my shirt. So these people are missing a protein, and it is a recessive gene. You, you have to have two people who have that recessive gene to marry. They would look pink because they have a dominant, regular colored blood gene and a recessive gene. And if then these two people with a recessive gene meet, then they have a 25% chance of having a child with this issue. In this particular case, this man, the father, has two, so he is passing two on to his children. One of them is definitely going to be passed on to his children, and his wife, who is a first cousin, also has one, and so they have a much higher chance of having blue children than the normal if you didn't, didn't marry your cousin. And that's one of the reasons why we don't marry cousins. First cousins are very possibly carrying the same genetic traits that you have. So you don't want to pass on those bad genetic traits to your children, so you marry someone who doesn't have your ancestry and hopefully won't have the same types of genes that you do. But it's very possible in a first generation cousin that you have the same genetics. And that's how the blue fugates were formed. And uh, they can take a protein which is missing from their, from their bodies that that gene does not produce properly and they will turn pink as long as they're taking that protein. There's only one left in the world who has the blue skin that I know of, and he actually was at the University of Kentucky recently. He's graduated, and he was taking his protein so he does not look blue, but if he stopped taking the protein, he would be blue. And you can imagine what it, what happens when a person is blue, how they're treated in life. We don't particularly like to treat people who are different than us uh, very well, and anyone who has different colored skin than the Caucasian majority knows that. And if you have slanted eyes instead of round eyes, you know you're treated differently because of that. We shouldn't treat people differently simply because of a single gene characteristic we do, many people do, uh, but we're all the human race. There's just one gene difference between the blue skin and, and Caucasian skin, or, or black skin and Caucasian skin, or yellow skin, or in my case, I am swarthy is what they call me. Uh, I can get very, very dark, and my mother, when she was a child in Georgia, had to sit at the back of the bus because she got very, very dark in the, su in the summertime. So because of one gene, we treat people differently. And that's just wrong. Let me go back to our lecture series, even though I'm lecturing you <laughs> right here. And that's the Blue Fugates. So we move on from the prenatal period to the neonatal period, which is uh, the newborn person. Newborn for the first month of their life is called a neonate. And the neonate, in many cases, has issues that would in other countries cause them to die. But in this country, we have some amazing medications and we have amazing hospitals and medical doctors that can 
help to keep that child alive where they would have died in another country. But in many cases also, we can only keep them alive for so long and then they pass away before the first year of life. And so we actually have a higher rate of deaths before one year of age after the, after the neonate period than other countries do. Most countries have deaths within the neonate period of time. We can, we can help ours to survive and give them a chance to survive, but we have a lot of deaths, a uh, higher death rate than many other countries, the first world countries, uh, in the first year of life. And that's the reason why, because we're so good at keeping them alive for, for at least the first few months. Now, in that first month, I've already said we, in the last chapter, we have 86 billion cells just in our brain. And this amount will not increase significantly throughout your lifespan. And it will even decrease later in life as you get older. And, of course, if you damage your brain, because it, they don't heal. So if you damage your brain, you've lost that neuron. And there are also another 50 billion glial cells in the brain that connect to the axons of certain neurons to help them to become better neurons, faster, healthier neurons. And the connections between the neurons when you're born have not finished being made. We have 86 billion neurons, but they're not all connected together. So the growth of the brain from birth until about 13 years of age is all these connections being made between neurons in your brain. It isn't brand new neurons, although we do, it seems, have 700 brand new neurons every single day, but that's minimal compared to the 86 billion in your brain. It wouldn't really cause much of an increase in weight, but our brain increases in weight from the time we're born until about the time we're 13 years old, 11 to 16. And that weight then at the end, when it reaches its final weight, the brain still keeps developing. So why doesn't it get any heavier? And the reason it doesn't get any heavier is because as it continues to develop from 16 years of age to about 21 years of age, it is also pruning the areas or killing off its own neurons that aren't being used and connections that aren't being used anymore. So the emphasis of growth in the brain after birth is making these connections and it's the growth of, the growth of these connections that are believed to play a role in the mental development of a child. We'll talk about Piaget in the next lecture but uh, Piaget talks about how our children learn material and, and what leaps and stages they have as they grow in their knowledge. And I said the brain reaches its final stage size in weight somewhere between 11 and 16 years of age. But we continue to grow and get bigger, obviously, and it's not because of the neurons being connected as it's... Uh, the growth of the brain doesn't create any more weight because there's also pruning that takes place. And pruning, if some of you may not know what pruning is, if you go out to a tree and a tree has too many branches over top of the lines, the electrical lines, they cut those branches off. That's called pruning. That's what pruning is. Newborns begin life equipped to deal with three basic survival tasks. They have to find nourishment, they have to grow, and they have to make contact with their helpers, the people that are around them, the adults, so they have to make connections with people, and they have to avoid harmful situations. And we have the capability of doing all of those when we're born. The newborn has numerous built-in, called innate, built-in reflexes that are present at birth. Neonates show pleasure at sweet tastes. So why would it be important to be able to be attracted to sweet things? What's the, what is it that would be useful? Anybody on the chats, why would it be useful to connect with 
pleasant, sweet tasting things. Nobody has any idea. You're growing. You need calories. Sweet things have sugar, carbohydrates in them for energy. You need that. And we're built to seek out the energy that we need. Now, people like me, who have already grown up, are also seeking the energy as well. Still, I am a definite sugarholic, and my stomach shows it. I am much heavier than I should be. I'm about 30 pounds heavier, but uh, I say my, my ring on my finger is my wedding ring, but uh, this stomach is my wedding band because she, she cooks really well. So uh, that's, we're still, even as adults, are seeking out sugar, many of us, where we don't need it anymore. It's really a bad thing for you. Uh, the, they are also, they're, dis, they're dissatisfied with sour tastes and rotten smells. They will turn their head away from something that is rotten smelling to us, but they didn't learn that. It's something that they have coming right out. They know they're, perp they're built to get away from anything that smells bad or tastes sour. And that's important for a little old child because bacteria and viruses are on food that's gone bad and uh, sour tasting things can be bad for you as well. And so they are protecting themselves by staying away from the rotten foods that could cause them to get sick and die. Infancy starts from the end of the first month. So the first month you are a neonate and then you are an infant. In Latin, enfant, and enfant actually means incapable of speech. So you are an enfant from the first month of your life to about one and a half years when we really start to begin to make words. So at one and a half years of age, you are no longer an infant. And this is important to make the distinction that they say words at one and a half. But at six months of age, any child who's been exposed to the to sign language will pick up sign language and be able to communicate in sign language, they will be able to tell you what they want at six months of age. They'll be able to communicate with you. That means that even the children who don't have sign language are able to communicate if they had the capability, and that's what makes them frustrated. They know what they want. They know what to tell you, but they can't tell you because they can't talk. The communication by hand is much easier because our communication, our ability to manipulate our fingers and our hands is much better than being able to manipulate our vocal cords, our lips, our tongue, all of the things that are required for speech. It's very complicated. And so we are, that takes a long time to develop, whereas I can communicate by sign language much easier. I can't. Uh, I have cousins who are deaf, uh, third, third cousins who are deaf, and my, my little, we used to call her little Aunt Rose, but Rose Olinoff, my aunt, uh, she started the School of Deaf in Philadelphia. So uh, we have a lot of deaf people in our family. And my wife can communicate fairly well with sign language, but I never picked it up. And I, I have trouble with my deaf cousins anyway because they won't wear cochlear implants, they won't find ways to improve hearing if they could because they say it's not a disability. And yet they walk around with glasses on. I'm like, if you don't want to fix your ears, then don't fix your eyes either. It's not a disability either to lose your vision and not be able to read. So stop wearing glasses if you're not going to wear a cochlear implant. And so we have arguments about that. But the Children at six months of age can pick up sign language. 
and I know very little. I don't know, I don't care, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> so those are the three things I really know in sign language. Uh, the other types of reflexes that we have are important as well for us to determine whether a child is born with the proper nervous system. So first of all, all of our senses are working when we're born. We can taste, we can smell, we can touch, all we can hear, we can see. In the womb, we learn to uh, we learn music in the womb. If, you're, if you put earphones on the belly of a, of a woman who's pregnant, that sound gets into the amniotic uh, fluid and, the, and they can hear those sounds. Sound actually goes better in liquid than it does in air anyway. So the vibrations are there for them. But their sight, they can smell, they can taste, they can feel in the womb, but there's nothing to see in the womb. So when you're born, your sight is the worst of all of your senses. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. The other types of reflexes that are built into us, uh, we don't have to know all these reflexes, but I'm going to list them here for you. The rooting reflex is very important. Uh, if something touches a child's cheek, the child will turn toward that thing, and when it touches their lips, they'll start sucking. So they're born with the ability to get nourishment. If they had to learn to feed from the breast, we, many more of us would probably die uh, before we learned how to, but it's built into us to do that. The, if you touch a child on their palm, they will wrap their fingers around whatever it is that touches their palm. It's an automatic reflex. So we have the rooting reflex, the palmer and plantar grasping reflexes, the moror reflex, the tonic neck reflex, the doll's eye reflex, Babinski stepping reflex, Bowers reflex, traction reflex, arm recoiling reflex, Gallant's reflex, crossed extension reflex, postural and grasping reflex. You don't need to know the, all these reflexes, but the point is we have built-in ability to move in specific ways. And when a child is born, they are tested to see if they have certain of these types of reflexes, because if they don't, then there's something wrong with their nervous system and they need intervention immediately. Now, premature children, of course, ha they shouldn't even be out of the womb yet. They're still baking. They should be baking, and they're not. And so they are going to be developing still, and obviously they're going to take a longer time. But it's not so obvious if a child is born a few weeks early. It's not that they're a few weeks behind. They can be months behind because they're now developing in an environment that they're not supposed to be developing in. They should still be in the amniotic fluid developing, not out in the atmosphere developing. And one of the big issues with premature children is breathing because their lungs aren't yet prepared for oxygen, getting it out of the air. They, they still should be breathing in amniotic fluid. And there is actually, in the development class, if you ever take the developmental psychology class, we'll talk about there is a liquid that actually carries oxygen that you can put into a baby's lungs, a premature child's lungs, that will allow the oxygen to move into their body even better than it does for air. They get more oxygenation than they do in air oxygenation. And so they're actually, their lungs are then filled with this liquid instead. Now, it hasn't been okayed by the FDA yet. It's at, out of the University of Pennsylvania that is doing this research. But there are people that's, that use this oxygenated liquid. It, it's not water. It's because uh, water holds on to its oxygen really strongly. Uh, it is a different type of liquid that allows the oxygen to be released. So infants have the ability to learn through classical conditioning. We know that they can 
learn in the womb. We can play music for them and outside of the womb, they'll recognize the music that they heard in the womb. They also recognize women's voices over men's voices. And that's most likely there, they like women's voices better. It's probably because when, they're, when their mother is talking, their mother is vibrating at the same frequency that they're talking, and so that's a higher frequency, and they're hearing it in the womb as their mother is talking to them. I've said that their vision is limited to 2,500, and I wish I could actually show you what 2,500 is, uh, but basically, if you're holding a child and your eyes are that far away from your child's eyes, that they can see you and focus on you. That is 2,500. They can see that. Anything further away, they won't be able to focus on it. This close, they can focus. And that's why it's very, very important to be able to hold your child while you are breastfeeding your child. Or if you use bottles, don't put the child down into the crib and let them suck on the bottle in the crib. Hold them anyway, just like you would breastfeeding, and give them the bottle so that they're that close to you because the connection made during that time when they can see you is extremely important for their brain development. My sister is 2,500, and she is legally blind in Virginia. Some states consider 2,500 legally blind. She has glasses that she still can see and read because of the glasses, but when she was very young, she did extremely well in school because she has a very, very high IQ. So they didn't pick up that she couldn't see the board and eventually, by the time she was seven years of age, they realized there was something wrong, and they did the tests, and they got her eyeglasses. Well, at seven, and I was 10 at that time, and we were on a bowling team together, and when she got her glasses, she came in the next, the next time we had league, and she looks at, she's like, oh my gosh, there's pins at the end of the alley. You've been telling me that for all this time. Now I know what you're talking about. I can see them finally. She said when she looked at a tree, she saw just one big mass of green. She didn't know they were separate leaves until they fell on the ground and she was picking them up. So that's 2,500 visions. It's very bad vision. And of course, children have nothing to look at in the womb, so their vision has no reason to develop in the womb. And it's probably why children dream so much, which we'll talk about in the consciousness section, because dreaming allows that occipital cortex to develop faster. And so they probably dream while they have what we call REM or rapid eye movement more than adults do. They also develop the ability to see cliffs, to see depth before they can crawl, which is about seven months of age, they can they see depth before they can crawl, which is very important so that they don't crawl off of a cliff and fall or the stairs. Uh, you still need to put up uh, the railings to keep them from making mistakes, but as they approach the steps, they should be able to see the depth and it scares them and they back away from it. And the way we know this is called the visual cliff experiment, where you put a child on a thick plastic that they can see that they're, they're about to fall, and it's before they can crawl, so they're just sitting there, and their heartbeat goes up, their perspiration goes up, their respiration goes up, and we see that as a sign of fear. They also connect to people very well. Everyone loves a giggling child. No one likes a screaming, crying child, but everybody likes a, a giggling child, and a child loves to smile at people and make connections with people, and that's important, obviously. They need people. They need the adults to take care of them, so making that connection is very important. They prefer the voices of women over men, most likely because they've heard their mother's voice for nine months. They're in the womb that their ears were working. And, and you can scare a child real easily by just walking up to them as a man and going, oh, you look so cute, you're a cute little boy. 
whoa, what is that? They don't like the deep voice and they don't like the fast speech. We have what used to be called mother ease, which is now called parent ease because mothers are not necessarily the uh, parent who's taking care of them. But in the past, when this was first uh, figured out, the mothers stayed home most of the time, so it was called mother ease. But we walk up to a child and we go, oh, you're so cute raising the frequency of our voice and slowing our voice down, it actually helps the child to learn the language. Some babies are actually born very shy and some are born fearless. It's a spectrum. Some are born right in the middle. If they're born very, very shy, we can make them a little less fearless by exposing them to certain things. And if they're very fearless, we can make them a little shy. And we should. A child should not be completely fearless and gregarious. If you take them to the store and they're just wandering around the store and they don't care where you are, they're just walking up to every person and everybody's a friend, that's dangerous in today's society. There are people out there that are not healthy for people to interact with. So this uh, fearless or shy types of children can be modified slightly, but a person who's, ex who's born totally gregarious is not going to be shy. They're just, they might have certain situations where they show some shyness, but they are generally always going to be gregarious, outgoing. And the ones who are very, very shy are, are not going to be the gregarious, outgoing types of people. We maintain what we're born with. Some babies are really easy to deal with. Others are not so easy to deal with. If you have an easy child as your first child, you'll probably have a second one. But if you have a difficult child the first time, you'll be thinking about maybe not have another child. I was uh, an easy child, and so was my sister right after me. But the Third, the, set, the third child, the second sister, was not an easy child. My mom raised Shelties, uh, Shetland Sheepdogs, or miniature collies, they're called. And I would be crawling around with the dogs, and if I was sleeping, I'd just go to sleep in the dog pen with the dogs or fall asleep under a table, a chair. It didn't matter. And when it got quiet, mom would go looking for me to make sure everything was okay. But the dogs looked after me. I thought I was a dog for a long time, I'm pretty sure. Uh, anyway, I thought my Dawn, who was the one Sheltie they kept inside, she was one year old when I was born. So I thought she was my sister. She was there. I held on to her when I took my first steps. And um, she followed me everywhere. And she was my playmate until my sister came along three years after that. So... The, I was a very easy child. My, my second sister was not an easy child. She would get tired but would not go to sleep. And she would scream and holler because she was tired and miserable, but she wouldn't go to sleep. And if you changed anything in the house, she was fearful of the changes in the house. And it was, uh, she was a very difficult child. And that was our last, that was my last sibling until my father got remarried and had a sibling later who is, um, what, 40 years younger than I am. So uh, that's a whole other story. So babies are just born. Some are easy, some are not so easy, difficult. And if you have a child who has colic, and this is something you should remember because colic is something that's pretty common. If you have a child with colic, colic hurts. It's very debilitating for the child. It's a stomach upset. And if you have a child with colic, you could put them in a chair on a dryer, turn the dryer on with uh, some sheets, some towels in it that are wet so, it, so the dryer bounces, and they will calm down. That is one way to calm down a colicky child. Our physical growth, of course, we start from a single cell, so for the first nine months, we are, we're growing tremendously fast because we come out totally well, ability to survive outside of the womb, although we still need help to survive. We have everything we need to live outside the womb within nine months, and uh, there, there is a still rapid growth that happens until a certain point 
Well, we sort of stop growing. It's very short, slow growth after that. And then we hit puberty and bang, we're off again to the races. Now, I, I don't know how many of you, most of you are already through puberty in my class, but this is going to, um, what I'm about to say, may shock some of you, and um, you may go, oh my gosh, that's why. Uh, if you, most children, boys, are at 13 years of age, girls at 12 years of age when they hit puberty and start growing. If they hit puberty earlier than that, than they're normal, they will be short. They will not be very tall compared to the rest of their family. If they wait after 12 and 13, another year, and hit puberty, they'll be taller. It's very, it's very, just that's the way it is. That's, so some of you may be very short, and, and you may remember the fact that, oh, you hit puberty early in life, and some of you may be taller in your family, and you hit puberty much later in life. And it's just the way it is. I, I was uh, very fast. In seventh grade, I already had a mustache, and I'm a short person compared to the rest of my family. And that's just the way it is. But now I can say to, pe to people when they say, you know, you're overweight, no, no, I'm under tall. <laughs> that's, I'm under tall. I'm not overweight. <laughs> I'm supposed to be much taller, and then this weight would actually match what I am. So <laughs> uh, physical growth then, humans do have this active phase, then uh, sort of slow phase, then active again. And then by 21, we're at the height we're going to be although our cartilage continues to grow, so our ears get a little bigger as we get older and our noses get a little bit bigger as we get older. And uh, the way we grow is what's called proximal distal. Proximal distal means we grow from the center out. So our fingers are much smaller than the rest of our body. Our arms start to grow later and our fingers later. So we grow from the middle section proximal to the distal the outside portions afterwards. And we also grow cephalocaudal as well. So when we're born, our heads are much larger in percentage-wise to our bodies than our, uh, our heads will be when we're finally finished growing. And our eyes are also much larger in our heads than they will be when we finish growing. So that's cephalocaudal, the head first, and the body next. So the areas closer to the head develop prior to the areas closer to the feet. This is very useful to certain animation types people. Uh, the anime from Japan, you are more attracted to anime that has larger heads than normal and larger eyes than normal. Check it out next time you look at animation and what you like why you like one character over another character and it's usually the eyes are larger the head is larger than the body so motor development occurs motor development occurs with mass motor development first and fine motor development later now of course by six months we're pretty fine in our fingers and our arms we can hold uh, we can show people certain characteristics and talk to them with our fingers and our hands. But to draw a circle, which is extremely fine motor control, I still can't draw a good circle at 63. But if you draw a circle, most children will be able to draw a circle by four years of age. So that's the very fine motor movements by four years of age. Although they can dance before they can walk. We'll talk about that in just a second. The word maturation, most of you have probably talked about people getting mature, being mature. And that's not what this word means in the developmental lifespan psychology. Maturation has nothing to do with learning something. And what we usually talk about maturing is that a person has learned to be a mature adult, but what maturation means in this case is that we have a genetic programmed building code 
So we're going to grow depending on what our genetics programming tells us we're going to do. And that's maturing through that process. We mature by following that programming code through the genetics and its environmental impacts. So is this particular maturation process continuous or discontinuous? And of course, that is an argument we've already talked about, and its verdict of that is still out. Let's look at a one-year time span for a normal child. Remember that some children are slower at development, some, some children are faster at development. Usually around six years of age, when we enter into first grade, everybody is about equal at that point. So even if the slower developing child uh, is, seems to be behind, by the time they get to six years of age, they've caught up. And the fast one at four years of age, by six years of age, everybody's caught up to them. Now there are the exceptions that are very slow and stay slow, and the very fast ones, which we'll talk about in the intelligence chapter, Michael Kevin Kearney, who graduated from elementary school at six years of age when most people are entering elementary school. So there are those that show the real capacity of the human brain in its developmental capacity. So here's a one year time frame. From birth to one month, the child at one month will respond to sounds in their environment and they will become quiet when they're picked up normally, but they will vocalize occasionally. Vocalizing meaning not screaming and crying, which is a type of communication. Remember, we have a communication class. There's a communication section in this as well that you need to listen to, but communicating by crying is very, very successful. A parent, and many of you are parents, a parent knows when the child is crying because they're hurt, different cry, than when they're hungry, different cry, than when they're bored or feeling lonely, different cry, than when their diaper needs changing. So they still communicate by crying in different ways, and the responsive parent makes good connections with their child because they recognize those cries and will take care of the problem that the child is trying to communicate with that cry. But vocalization is just trying, making the noises that will eventually become speech. At two months, they will smile socially. At one month, they're not smiling socially. And in it, what they're doing is just, they're just using those muscles. But when they see people now at two months of age, they will smile and when someone talks to them, they will smile. And when you smile at them, they will smile back. They will also, if you're holding the child properly and at the right distance so that they can actually focus on your face at the 2,500 that they have, they will recognize your face and, as the mother or a father, whoever's holding them. And they can roll side from their side to their back again. And they can, on their back, they can lift their heads up and they can hold it pretty steady. At three months, they vocalize to the smiles and talking of adults still, and they search for sounds. This is interesting. They've made a connection here in their brain. I hear a sound in the environment. I can use my eyes to find out where that sound is coming from. That's a very important connection that they're making between the two senses. And they can sit with some support with their head pretty steady, not rocking around and falling down. So their muscle control is getting better. At four months, they can gaze, will follow different things in their environment, spoons, dangling rings, balls that move across tables. And if you get to the developmental psychology section uh, in, in a class of developmental psychology, they, there's a whole section here that we talk about uh, the way that the child will notice when things are there and when they won't notice that things are missing. And then all of a sudden they notice when things are missing, but they don't know where they are based on what they've seen and um, the knowledge that they have of other people's ability to recognize what things are. They will sit with very slight support at this point. At five months, they will discriminate strangers. 
And this is really sad for the grandparents who have been visiting every, every day, uh, but don't live with the family. And what the child does is finally make a distinction between people who live in my house and people who don't. And the people who don't are strangers, even though it's your grandmother and grandfather and they've been holding you for five months, they are still the stranger. They're not the person that lives in the house with me. And uh, it becomes a real issue for a little while while they start to make the connection back again. They can turn from their back onto their side now rather than from their side just roll back. They can now pull themselves onto their side and they make very distinct vocalizations. They're starting to pick up the sounds in their environment and that's one of the ways that we learn to talk is we hear the sounds that are in our environment and we repeat those sounds back to the people that are making those sounds. Any sounds that are not made, and there are plenty of sounds that are not in specific languages, we have uh, in English, we have very specific sounds that aren't in Japanese. Japan has sounds, Japanese has sounds that are not in the uh, English language. And so Japanese children will not will start to dis those particular sounds that aren't in the language disappear out of their vocalizations. And as adults, they have a hard time hearing them. So my sister grew up in Japan when we were in Japan. My little sister, uh, who's the, set, the third child, and she would say things like, it's plastic, it won't break because there's no R in Japanese. And she was learning English and Japanese at the same time, and she had a Japanese accent because she was learning the language mostly from our nanny who took care of us when mom and dad were gone, which was all the time. So the, she had this accent, and she had a hard time hearing the R sound in the language because there is no R sound in Japanese. And of course, a person who just learned Japanese, they're going to have a very hard time hearing the R sound. And us, there are people I'm sure that have tried, you said, how do you say hello in your language? And they'll tell you, and then you say, and they go, no, that wasn't it. It's, and they repeat, the, and you go, but that's what I said. No, that's not what you said, because you can't even hear the sounds that they're making. So they're starting to make these distinctive vocalizations at five months of age. At six months of age, of course, they can use their hands to communicate with. Uh, they smile at mirror images of themselves, and they reach for small objects and grab the small object, and they actually successfully grab that object, and now they can lift up a cup and they can bang it on the ground, on the, on the table. And at six months of age, they're doing this because their hand-eye coordination is much better. Before that, they reach for it so fast that they bang into that object and knock it off the table. So if they could have grabbed a hold of it, they could have then worked on their grabbing reflex, but as soon as they, uh, grabbing ability, as soon as they reach for it, it gets knocked off the table. They can't touch it. But what we can do is to put a glove on a child with Velcro on it and then put all the objects around them with Velcro. And at four months of age, we'll reach out and grab it and it'll stick to their hand and then they can, they can use the muscle action of grabbing and it turns out that they will be able to grab hold of a cup and bang it much earlier than six months of age without the glove on because they've been able to practice it. But again, being able to do that at, at six years of age, everybody's pretty much caught up and it doesn't really give them an advantage to be able to do that, but we can actually improve those skills early in life. At seven months, they make playful responses to the mirror in themselves. And we're one of the only animals that do. They're, Dolphins will also see themselves and, and have fun with themselves in the mirrors. Uh, if you put in an aquarium where there are dolphins, if you put a video camera on one side of the aquarium and a, 
and a monitor on the other side that sees what's on the video camera. Dolphins learn that they can, they can play with that. They, they'll all hang around the monitor while one of them goes over to the camera and makes faces in the camera and the other ones are laughing and having a good time watching them and then he'll come back another one will go over to the camera and make faces so they're pretty amazing animals and chimpanzees and gorillas if you put something on their forehead and then show them a mirror they don't reach out to the mirror they'll reach right up to their heads and pull off whatever it was that was on their forehead they recognize that that thing in the mirror is themselves. And that's a very powerful mental ability to be able to do that. They can sit alone very steadily, and at seven months, they can start to crawl. And this is where you recognize, oh, my gosh, my child has a mind of its own because you have put them down somewhere at four months of age, five months of age, six months of age, set them down and you can do something and when you turn around they're still sitting there so oh they must have really liked the place where you left them no they just can't leave <laughs> they can't get out of that place and as soon as they can crawl boy they are all over the place and and you realize they have their own mind and you have to watch out you have to be very careful because they're crawling and they're not watching where they're going and they hit the edges of tables and put gashes in their heads you have to make things safe for the child. Also, I don't care how well you clean up, and any of you who are parents knows, I don't care how well you clean up, they're going to find something on the floor that's dangerous. When we had our little baby, um, my wife and I have no children, but what we adopted a child when she was nine years old, and we knew her when she was a child, when she was a baby. And when she would come over, we would make a little area in the house where we would confine her to that area, and we'd clean everything up in that area, and then we'd play with her in this particular area. And <laughs> I swear, every single time, she would find a knife or something that was dangerous. And I'm like, we just cleaned up. How did she find this? And they will, they will find whatever it is that's dangerous on the ground. And um, I don't know where those things come from, but they're good at it. They're really good at it. At eight months of age, they vocalize up to four different syllables. They're getting really good at starting to say things that will eventually be words. They listen very selectively to familiar words. They now know all these words that you're saying. Well, at six months, they know words because they can respond using sign language. And they will pull themselves to a standing position and hold themselves upright, but as soon as they let go, they'll fall back down again. But when they pull themselves up on a chair, for instance, and they're holding onto the chair, and there's music, they will dance, they will bounce to the music, in rhythm to the music. So they can dance before they can walk. At nine months of age, they are continuing to improve all their motor skills, and by 10 months of age, they have very good motor skills. Patty cake is that's exceptional ability for hand-eye coordination. And by 11 months, they can stand alone, but they try to take a step and they fall back down again. But by 12 months of age, they are walking. And almost immediately after that, running. <laughs> so the, the what a child will do if it runs away from you. You're outside with the child and the child runs away and you go running after them to catch them because you don't want them to run into the neighbor's yard. Uh, now, if they're running toward the street, go after them. But if you're in the backyard and they're just running away from you, stay where you are. There's a rubber band between you and that child. And that rubber band, they will not get as far away from you as you think they will before they stop. And then there's like a satellite. They won't be any further than that away from you. But if you're running after them, then the rubber band isn't being stretched. You're continuing to stay close to them. So now in a store, they don't recognize that you're not around them because there's so many other people around them, and they will get out of hand in the store. And I sure... I. Uh, there are people that are against this, but I don't 
think there's anything wrong with putting a child on a leash so that they can wander around in that particular space that the leash allows them on their own and figure things out on their own, but they're connected to you so that they don't wander off. Because especially a gregarious, outgoing child can get lost easily and get kidnapped easily or something bad happened to them. So for especially a gregarious child, now a shy child is going to stay around you mostly anyway uh, without getting, and probably get under your feet, so it's hard to get around with them under your feet. But a child on a leash, I don't see any problem with that. Remember that this is a spectrum. There are people who are slower, people who are faster. Their neglect um, is a very negative thing, not giving a child enough nutrition or love, uh, access to different things in their environment. And of course, a premature child is not going to be just a few weeks behind, but will be months behind and might even be another a year before they catch up with what other children are doing. But by six years of age, almost all children are equivalent or right around the same abilities, not way ahead and not way behind. So it's not such a horrible thing if your child isn't speaking at one and a half years of age. Give them some time. My child that we adopted at nine, she wasn't speaking at two. But then her brother came along, and a year later, when her brother started speaking, then she started speaking because he was getting attention that she wasn't getting, so she started speaking. And when she started speaking, she wouldn't shut up. And she's still that way today. And she just, jab, 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 jab. She's 12 now. So we're going to talk about the theories that people have about why and how we develop. Freud has his psychosexual stages. Piaget is how children think in particular stages. Harlow talks about attachment. We'll talk about Erickson, who's the only one that really has a lifespan from, from birth to death, that he talks about our social connections with people. And Kohlberg talks about moral reasoning. Erickson's the only one that goes a whole lifespan. All the rest of them go from birth to about 21 years of age. The first one we're going to talk about is Freud. Now, unfortunately, Freud's is called the psychosexual stages because he talks about erogenous zones, and we think erogenous is sex, but that's not what he's trying to, he's saying erogenous is things that arouse us, that make us feel good. Our skin makes us feel good. Our lips have more nerve endings in them than our fingers do. So, Children at the beginning of life, when, when they're able to grab things and hold them and try to figure out what is this thing, we as adults know what germs are, so we use our fingertips to figure out what they are. But children don't know, and their lips are way more sensitive than fingertips, so they push them against their lips to see what they feel like. And as long as they're there, they might as well stick them into their mouth and see what it tastes like, too. And that's why children are always shoving things into their mouths. But this has nothing to do with sex itself. It's what he called erogenous zones. So it's not about oral sex. It's not about anal sex. It's not what it's about. The oral stage is all about the fact that children from birth to one year are originally given liquid to eat. And then... They are, given, they are weaned on the, from the liquid. At six months of age, they, they should be on liquid and start to show, give them something more solid. And by the time they're a year old, they should be on solid food. And some children, this is, a, this is horrible to them. They do not take it well. They don't like the weaning process. And those who have a problem with it, end up being what's known as an oral aggressive. Oral aggressive people are people who like to chew on things. They'll chew on pencils, they'll chew on their fingernails, 
and they bite. They'll bite people when they get excited. They bite. So that's an oral aggressive person. And what Freud says is they didn't like the weaning process and got stuck in the oral stage. And what we're supposed to do is go through these stages. So after a year, you shouldn't be in the oral stage anymore. You should be in the anal stage. And but people get stuck. And then as adults, they have to learn to go through the rest of these stages. So the anal stage, anal retentive person is a person who had a really hard time when their parents were like, you're going to go on the toilet. You're not going in your diaper anymore. And you, what do you mean? I've, I've been going in the diaper for years now. And all of a sudden, for, and you're telling me all, I got to go. I got to wait. I have to go. I have to wait until I can get to the toilet to go. And so people who have a problem with that end up being anal retentive people. Uh, more like a OCD. So the phallic stage talks, it means phallic means penis, but it's not about sex again. It's about knowing that you are a male or knowing that you are a female because of what your body has. You are either male or female. There are certain people, a uh, certain percentage of people who are born with both, but very few. And most of us will end up knowing I'm a boy or I'm a girl and recognizing that if I'm a boy, my dad is like me and my mom is not like me. And as a girl, my mom is like me and my dad is not like me. And you know it's permanent. Before this stage, Freud says, children think if you put a boy in a dress, they think you're going to change them to a girl, that they're going to change into a girl. They don't know it's permanent. And by three to six years of age, they've recognized I am what I am and that's what I'm going to be. Now, he also said that we have this connection we make with our opposite sex to parent. So a boy makes this connection to his mom and a girl makes the connection to their father. And they want to have all the attention from that opposite sex to parent. So if I am a boy, I want my mother to pay attention to me. I want her to talk to me. I want her to cook for me. I want her to help me do things in the house. I, I, I want my mom's attention, all of it. And when my dad comes home, mom gives him attention. Mom is hugging dad. Mom's kissing dad. Mom's talking to dad about his day at work. I, I, I wish dad was dead so she didn't have to give him any attention. She could give me all the attention. And that's what the Oedipus complex is all about from Freud. Now, it's called Oedipus for the men and Electra for the girls. And what it means is that we fall in love, is what he, he calls it, fall in love with our opposite sex parent and wish the other parent was dead. And he gets this from a Greek tragedy. The Greek tragedy is a king has a boy, child, and the prophets come to the king and say to him, your boy child is going to kill you one day. And so the king, he accepts what the prophets are saying, so he takes his little boy up into the mountains, and he leaves the infant boy up in the mountains to die. But the king of the neighboring kingdom is walking along the same path and comes across this baby boy and he has no children, and he thinks this child has been sent by the gods, and so he takes the child as his own and never tells the child that he was adopted, tells the child he's his own child. And the child grows up in this other kingdom. And then comes of age, as the prince of the kingdom, he gets to go to the oracle at Delphi to have his prophecy read. And the oracle tells him, you will kill your father but I love my father. I don't, I would never, I'm not, I'll, I will run away from my kingdom so I don't kill my father. And so he runs away from his adopted kingdom and ends up in the kingdom where he was born and unknowingly he comes across the king and they have an argument and he kills the king and then he finds out, oh my gosh, that was the king 
and everybody seems to love him. He was a wonderful person. I should never have done that. And I've left his 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 wife as a as a widow. So, I, I, but I'm the prince of my own kingdom. So. I can marry her, and I'll be the king of your kingdom, and I will make up for the loss of your kingdom. So he marries the queen, who is his mother, and that is where Freud gets this whole thing, that we want the father to be killed, and, the, and we want to marry our mother, or have, they, and, and have our mother love us forever and ever. And, um, of course, in the Greek tragedy, he does find out that this is his mother, and he rips his eyes out. <laughs> Greek tragedies. <laughs> so that's the um, Oedipus and Electra stages. The latency stage, we're in school. And so we have to find new ways to use our energies and our intellectual abilities. So our energy shift to physical and intellectual activities and not so much play anymore. And then we have to delay uh, or all find alternate gratifications um, in our life. Rather than the ways that we used to find pleasure in life, we have to find new ways to do it that are socially acceptable ways. And then there's the genital stage, which is the last stage. And this is certainly is a sexual stage because you're learning to love to fall in love. Now he, of course, grew up and lived in Victorian England, just after the Victorian era. And so when he talks about falling in love and making connections with other people and developing sexual relationships, he's talking about man and woman. He's not talking about man, man, and woman, woman, or man, woman, women, man, one, you know, whatever. Uh, we, in our day and time, in the newer um, acceptance uh, that we have today, it would be anyone that you would fall in love with, developing a loving, caring relationship that would eventually lead to sexual relationship. And uh, today we have, of course, heterosexuals who are opposite sex, and we have homosexuals which are the same sex, and we have bisexuals who they have the feeling of love and that sensation of the flushing of the skin when you, when you see somebody that really is attractive and they get that feeling from both sexes. That's the bisexual. And of course we have um, from science fiction the omnisexual who is attracted to anything, doesn't have to be human, because in science fiction we have aliens all over. And, but in the colonies, in the U.S. colonies, the very first person to be tried and put to death by a jury and a judge was a person who was an omnisexual, and he was put to death for that reason because he would not leave the farmer's sheep alone. <laughs> so that is um, Freud's uh, psychosexual stages. Now, people like to see the visual of it, and this is a, this is a good visual of the psychosexual stages showing that the it ends at about 21 years of age and then there's this this big void from 21 he didn't care he did not care about what happened to you after the age of 21 if you were 56 years old and had a pathology develop in his mind that pathology was due to something in the first 21 years of your life that you are stuck somewhere in one of those stages and you need to find your way through that stage. Now today's post-Freudian and new neo-Freudians, the new Freudians, they do believe that we do have what is happening to us right now is important as well as what happened in our past. But they still have a very high level of what happened in your past is very important. And that's the end of the class. We'll stop here at Cognitive Development. I'll pick that back up when we come back next week. Uh, if you have not put in your name and said you're here, please do so. And if you want to stick around and talk, ask a question, I'm here. Other than that, have a great weekend. Stay healthy, and I'll see you later. Bye.